Hello, and welcome to the Gilbo Girls Show, where you will have the opportunity to hear from mothers, fathers, siblings, and individuals themselves about their journey of living with a disability. I know, I know, it's called Gilbo Girls, but we have a bonus for you as we get the Gilbo boys to interview some of the dads and siblings and get their perspectives too. We'll also have special guests from time to time to share the many resources that are available to those living with a disability and their families. So get ready to laugh, smile, cry, maybe even get a little angry when you hear some of these stories of their day-to-day -day struggles. But let's not forget their many triumphs. As they say, it takes a village. And if it weren't for our village, we wouldn't be where we are today. So join us. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Gilbo Girl Show. I'm your host today, Karen Gilbo, and today we have special guest Nathan can you pronounce it for me? Guterres. Guterres. Thank you. <laughs> so Nathan is the founder and CEO of Wheel Life Enterprises, was born with spina bifida, uses a manual wheelchair for his daily mobility needs, and has never let his physical disability stop him from what he sets out to accomplish. Nathan has always been encouraged by his parents to be as independent as possible, including getting a higher education so that he could be independent. He played wheelchair basketball as a child into his early adult years, learned how to drive, graduated with a degree in business, and has worked in the private, nonprofit, and public sectors. He also coached high school boys and girls basketball. While in college, Nathan experienced a chronic illness that was soon diagnosed as kidney failure. After three years of dialysis treatments, Nathan had a successful kidney transplant, thank God, um, with his father as his living donor. He would finish his degree in business after returning to school. Nathan is also a two-time two -time TEDx speaker and has been a paid professional speaker. He loves helping people with physical disabilities and their families develop a plan for independence so that they can live with purpose and freedom. I love that. So first off, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. I've been very excited for this. Um, well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You are welcome. So let's just dive in. Let's start with your childhood. Can you share with us what it was like growing up? What were some of your physical challenges uh, that you faced and how did you overcome some of those? Sure. So uh, I'm the firstborn of two children. Uh, I have a younger sister who's three years younger. Um, basically grew up like most families, I think. Uh, I was born in LA and uh, when I was about five years old, my mom wanted us to, to be out of the, the city, and so we moved a couple of hours north to a city called Bakersfield. It's also called uh, Nashville West, if you're into, into uh, country music. Cool. And um, so been here since I was about five years old, and I, I had all of the other, I had all the responsibilities that my sister had, basically, as far as house chores and, you know, responsibilities, uh, learned to take care of myself. Um you know, my my parents really wanted me to be raised to be as independent as possible. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are certain things that I'm not able to do or I have to modify it to do those things. But we always managed to find a way to make it work. Uh, when we first moved to Bakersfield and to this day, I, I really don't know why, uh, but my dad wanted to move into a, a large house. And at that time, that entailed moving into a two story house. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't walk and never have been able to. And so, of course, all of the rooms were upstairs. So early on, I learned that if I was going to get to my room, I had to learn how to crawl up the stairs. Mm -hmm. So punishment was uh, extra punishment. Uh huh. <laughs> in that uh, the punishment was actually going to my room, not being in my room. But it really built character looking back, you know, 30 years later. But at the time, it wasn't fun. And that was because my mom really instilled the fact that I needed to be independent. Mm -hmm. I'd always try and get my way by crying and, you know, that kind of thing as, as a kid would do, but she never bought into it. Uh, I could get my dad to carry me up the stairs every once in a while. But, you know, looking back, I think that that was really the beginning of helping me develop into an independent person. Uh, as far as school is concerned, I was in special education until first grade, mm -hmm. uh, where I started to do a, a half day schedule between special ed and the second half would be mainstream education. Mm -hmm. And then from second grade on, I was mainstreamed into regular education full time. 
That's awesome. I know that the the going up the stairs thing, in a way, it's like, because it, we always had a two-story house. So Faith was either used to crawling up and down the stairs or later eventually holding onto the rails to go up. And then we moved into um, the rancher. And in a way, it's great because I don't have to worry about things. But then again, in some ways, it's less exercise for her. You know what I mean? So sometimes it's more of a task now if we go somewhere where there are stairs, if she or she goes like to her friend's house to to go up them. Um, so I think even even that um, making you do that prepares you for some some things and also challenge you challenges you physically and helps you with exercise and strengthening too. Like if you look back it, on those it, things, it, you know, it does. And, and it also, let's not forget, it also exercises the, the mindset and patience and, yeah. you know, some of those other things as well. Yeah. So you said you had a younger sister. Um, what was the dynamic? Did both of your, um, parents work full time? Um, and how did they juggle bringing you? Cause I'm sure you had to go to occupational therapy, physical therapy, that kind of thing. Yeah, so my dad worked full time. Um, my mom was actually going to school to become a, a beautician at the time. And, uh, you know, of course, this is many, many years ago. Uh, my mom ended up finishing school and then she started cutting hair um, part time, if I recall back then. And so, you know, she was always there. She was always the primary caretaker. Right. So about four years after we moved to Bakersfield, uh, my parents ended up divorcing. Mm -hmm. And my dad actually would, would commute every day from Bakersfield to LA and then back home. So that was a four, four and a half hour commute for him. And then he would come home and then, you know, we'd eat dinner and then my mom would have to go to, to school uh, to finish up her hair license. So we did that for about three or four years. And then, um, and then they divorced. And then we ended up moving, we ended up staying in Bakersfield uh, and then my sister, me and my mom, and then my dad moved back down to LA just to be closer to work. And he had, and still has family down in that area. So it was just more convenient for him. Mm -hmm. And then we would go down and we'd meet him halfway uh, and every other weekend for visitation. Uh, so essentially I, I lived with my mom for most of my life. Uh, along with my my little sister, but we always had a, a good relationship with my dad. Always always maintained that, so he was always you know and awesome. still is in in my life. That's awesome. And then my sister doesn't have any disabilities of any kind, um, and in fact, she got married earlier this year to a, a really good guy. And um, you know, she doesn't live here anymore. She lives out on the coast now and living her life. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Did she, so did she have to um, help you out with a lot of different things that, that you, maybe you couldn't do or. She did uh, when she was young there, I, I found out until I was about seven, maybe eight that she learned real quick that because my mom was making me independent, that she wasn't going to uh, continue to help me out uh, mm -hmm. because she saw that my mom wanted me to, you know, have that independence and I could no longer play that game with my sister of, you know, feel sorry for me, help me out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, from that point on, it changed the dynamic a little bit, but, you know, we fought like any other mm -hmm. siblings do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we loved each other, of course, but we also got on each other's nerves. nerves so really yep. the dynamic between us was not any different than any other siblings. Right. And, and I, I, I agree. Cause that same thing with my daughter and, and, and our son. And, um, if anything, it, I think that it has made them stronger, have more patience, um, have more empathy, uh, as well too, to, to be honest, um, because they got, because they, they also, they live with you and they see that and they see, you know, that there's so many things that people out there take things for granted. And they, you know, they saw your struggles. JD saw Faye's struggles, saw what mom and dad do and the extra mile that we go to, to help out and stuff. So, um, so I really truly think that it makes them better people. Um, I don't know. That's just my opinion. <laughs> no, it, it's true. And, you know, in my sister and in my situation, when we were going to school, uh, going to college, we we ended up staying together, living together for quite a while. And so we lived together for a long, long time. And looking back, we lived together for far too long. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, once she was able to move away and, and, you know, started this relationship with her now husband, um, our relationship improved tremendously. tremendously. So now we're, we're much, much closer. 
And while we're very different in our personalities, and, and we do have some differences, of course, in terms of how we look at things in life, as, as we all do, do. Mm -hmm. um, we respect each other's opinions now. And we, because we're not constantly in each other's face, um, we get along so much better. better. And so we're, we're very close now. That's awesome. What about it, back when you were in school? Did you find it difficult making friends and hanging out with your friends um, outside of school? You know, in grade school, I had a lot of friends. I had a lot of friends in class and on the playground, uh, even if they were in other classes. I was always just Nathan. I wasn't even seen as the guy in the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. I was just me. And it was great. You know, they play basketball with me and I couldn't really shoot the ball. I just wasn't strong enough at that time, but they always included me. And that was great. I, I had a lot of fun back then. Uh, in fact, I still have a number of those friends in my life today. Mm -hmm. We don't talk as often anymore, except through, you know, the, the wonderful technology that well, we have that is mm -hmm. social media. But um, those were my first friends in school. Outside of school, we didn't hang out a whole lot just because I think you know, we were young, first of all, and I, I don't think they truly knew how to handle my situation. You know, again, not not a knock against them. It was just right. It was just that time. Yeah. Just that time in our life. But I did have friends more in the disability community, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a really good friend and who's still a friend of mine, Josh. Um, we were best friends from the time I was six. He was eight. So he's a couple years uh, older than me. Uh, we met through a camp that I used to attend. I attended for about 10 years and it's for kids with disabilities. We'd go up to the mountains for a week and hang out and play games and have water balloon fights and craft time and you know things like that. So I, I maintained friendships from those opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, other friends that I had included uh, adults at the time who were mm -hmm. basically my parents' age or around my parents' age and older. Mm -hmm. uh, they were part of a wheelchair basketball team here in town called the Rolling Chariots. And so I ended up meeting them in the mall one day when I was about six years old, my mom and I were just going shopping and they rolled up to me and said, Hey, and little did I know that they would be my first friends when I moved to Bakersfield. Um, and I'm still friends with many of them today. And those were the, the, the men and women who really taught me how to become a, a successful person with a disability. Mm hmm. I love that. I know with with Faith, when she was younger, same thing, you know, it, it was great. She had a lot of friends and um, they always included her. They knew what she could and couldn't do, would always step in to help. And, but she really only had one real friend um, that she actually would go over. And I totally trusted her mom. Her mom was great. Her mom had, you know, no qualms about helping her in the bathroom or doing whatever she needed to do. She actually had her sleep over one time. Well, actually the first time and then a few times after that. Um, and it was, it was, it was really good. But as they got older, then you could see kind of that gap. And then they started going places and doing things that she really couldn't do or attend. And then Faith always gravitated, gravitated to the adults um, because she couldn't keep up with them. And then, you know, middle school and high school. And she has a few friends now, um, but it but it was always difficult um, outside of school as she got older, I think, definitely for sure. Because, yeah. you, you know, a lot of them, too, their homes were, aren't accessible or even though we try to, like, get her there and stuff, it's just sometimes it's difficult, you know? Yeah, I, I can definitely relate to that. And I think you hit the nail on the head with my experience as well. Um, junior high, middle school and high school, those were those were the times when I saw a significant change in my types of friendships, the number of friends I had. I would say that I had a lot of acquaintances. Mm -hmm. I knew a lot of people at school and we would hang out a little bit. But as far as hanging out after school or at, you know going to the movies oh, or something mm -hmm. like that, it, it really didn't happen, at least not very frequently. Right. I can probably think of a few instances Um in junior high and then maybe a few more in high school, but not really. I mean, it was very few and far between, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, for various reasons, you know, as you get older, you start getting into, you know, dating and, mm -hmm. and then, you know, driving and things like that. And it, it really does make a difference um, in how you can accomplish those things. And then you're also uh, very right about, you know, going to people's houses and, I still fight with that today. My number one concern is always where's the bathroom and, you know, can I even get in it? In it. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely can relate to those challenges. Yeah, absolutely. 
So did you experience any bullying or anything um, back then? No, um, not really. Not that I recall. If anything, especially in high school, I experienced the very opposite okay. where I was ignored. And yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say it was intentional, you know, being ignored or anything, but it was just they passed by me and it's like I wasn't there a lot of times. Yeah. And everybody knew who I was, especially in high school, but I just wasn't part of the the clicks Clicks. that were developing at that time, you know, and I, I look back now and I think I I had friends in every group. And I, by the way, I use the word friends very, very loosely, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, at that time in my life, I knew a lot of people in several of those groups and they would, they would say hi to me, but that's about as far as it went. Mm -hmm. Uh, There were even many times where I'd be sitting there with, with a couple of friends that I did have, and they also had disabilities and, you know, again, looking back, it was mostly my fault because I didn't really have a positive attitude back then. I, I felt jaded, mm-hmm. you know, among my peers. Mm-hmm. So I'd always have this look on my face. And so I, I remember one time when a couple of girls passed by and my buddy, Chris, back then, he had a muscular dystrophy and he would he would just kind of give him the little, uh, you know, heads up nod kind of thing and smile. And they go, oh, hey, how you doing? And then I would be sitting right there and I looked at him this one time and I said, what the heck was that? And he goes, and he, what? And I said, well, they said hi to you and I'm sitting right next to you. you. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, maybe you just need to be a little more friendly or something. And it just, I don't know, it burned me in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so over the years, I've had to be intentional about being friendlier. And I think I'm a friendly guy. I just think that Some people don't know how to approach people with disabilities to even talk to them, I feel like sometimes. Right. Well, and I also think that, you know, like anybody else, we're worried about being judged in a certain way. Mm -hmm. You know, how do I look? How do I speak? Do they think I'm smart? Do we have things in common? Can we hang out together? You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so especially during high school, it's very, very challenging for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But... Mm. So, okay, let's move on to college. Did you, was that something you always wanted to do? Did you stay in the dorm? Um, You know, how was your college experience? My college experience was much better uh, from an academic standpoint, social standpoint. So I, I, I went to junior college right out of high school. I just wasn't prepared for the university. So I was living at home and I wanted to be more social. That was one of my main goals goals at that time. Not that school wasn't important, but, you know, looking back, it's a little embarrassing to think about it now, but school really took a back seat for a couple of years because I just, I I crave that socialization that I didn't get the the four years in high school and even before that uh, in junior high. So I wouldn't always, you know, go to class or do what I needed to do academically to, to move forward in that aspect. So I'd be hanging out in the cafeteria or saying hi to people because it was a brand new world, you know, and in college, you're going to a place where there are a bunch of people who don't know you. And so it's almost like a fresh start. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I'm going to make the most of this. And while it didn't turn out exactly like I wanted it to, or the way I envisioned, it, it was better. So I thought, well, even if it's incrementally better, I'll take it. Mm hmm. At that time, too, unfortunately, um, you know, as I was making progress, slow progress, uh, and then it ended up taking me about four years to get out of a two-year college, and a lot of that was my fault, again, just not doing what I needed to do, and just the the immaturity on my part to take care of business. Mm -hmm. Um, Towards the end of that, I ended up feeling sick, and I wasn't sure why, and that's when I was diagnosed with renal failure or kidney failure. And so then I had to go on that journey. And then that's at the time I was transitioning over to the university. So that opened up another, another set of issues I had to contend with while going to school. Right. Talk a little bit about that. Um, Share your experience. How did you find out and what, you know, what did you have? I mean, I can imagine even what was going through your head at that point and what, and, and this is, I'm probably ignorant, but like, so what caused, do you know what caused that or how? 
Is that common for people with spina bifida or is it just something that was totally outside of the norm or? Yeah. So spina bifida had something to do with it indirectly. I suppose there's really no 100% causal explanation, but it does have to do with the spina bifida. And the reason why I say it that way is because I, I have many friends with spina bifida who never had those issues. Right. So, but in my case it did. So I, I can't tell you 100% certainty with with 100% certainty that that's what caused it, but it was a, a big factor. Mm-hmm. So I remember that um, it was summertime. So I had just finished. Uh, I was still at the junior college at the time, and I just finished our our last semester. So I was on summer break, and I'm sitting at my dining room table, and I don't know, I was reading sports news probably, and and uh, having lunch or something, and I just um, I wasn't feeling well and I just thought, okay, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just stressed from school because school had just ended. Mm-hmm. So I was, I was anxious and things like that. And so after about two weeks of that, um, I would, well, during that two weeks, I would go to bed, sleep for 10 or 12 hours in mean, a long time. I'd get up and then I'd get sick. I, I couldn't keep food down no. as much as I tried and so finally, my mom said, look, I know you're, I know you're an adult, but I, I'm taking you to the hospital because this isn't right. Right. So of course, being a young adult, I fought it <laughs> and it, it, it really saved my life because she took me to the doctor. We got some blood tests done. Um, we did the, the, the pat down checkup, as I call it, you know, they just patch it down and say, oh, you look great. You know, what are you, what are you doing? Maybe you're stressed out. And I said, well, I'm in college. And they said, oh, that's probably it. You're just stressed about school, but you're fine. So I came home and again, I was sitting at, a, at my dining room table on my computer and I got a call from one of my doctors and they said, well, we got your results back, your blood results, and you're in stage five renal failure, which is kidney. I didn't know what the word renal meant at the time. Right, right. And they said, you need to go to the hospital right now. And I said, well, what are you talking about? They go, your kidneys are failing and you're going to die if you don't move. So I called my mom who was at work at the time. And I said, look, I know this is a big thing, but you need to leave work and come home and get me right now. And, uh, yeah, I had my driver's license by that time and everything, but I said, I, I don't really want to drive myself into doing this news. Yeah. She rushed home. She took me to the emergency room here in town. They did more blood work, hooked me up to IVs, all kinds of things. I ended up calling my dad again, who was working in LA and living in LA. And I said, look, I, here's the quick story. I need you to come get me or I need you to be here. So he came up late later that night. Um, we made arrangements for me to stay in a hospital in LA, a hospital where I had several of my doctors since basically since birth. Mm-hmm. And my dad picked me up and drove me down there. We got there probably midnight, 1 a.m., and they admitted me. I spent the next week in the hospital doing dialysis. And that was that was my life for the next three years was dialysis three days a week, three hours per treatment. Mind you, I was still in school that entire time. Uh, I was just transferring to the university. So now I was going to a unit across from my school. So then I would do dialysis. They do the, you know, they do the needle in the arm. Mm-hmm. I had a catheter in my chest, a port. And then they, they, uh, tied up my veins in my arm. So they poke me there. I do treatment for three hours. They pull it out, wrap up my arm in just a ton of gauze. I drive across the street and go to class. And so I did that for about a year and a half. And, um, surprisingly I had the best grades in college during that time. <laughs> and I think it's because it took my focus off of school. Yeah, and- I was just going to say that. It, yeah. Yeah. You know, so I, I really realized at that point what was important. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, during that time, it took the focus off my disability. And so, you know, it's it's unfortunate for me to say this, but I didn't really feel like I accepted my my spina bifida until I was in my early 20s when this happened. Okay. Because when you're told you're gonna potentially die because of this situation nothing else is important at that point. Right. Your whole mindset so, changes. Yo, absolutely. So then I thought, well, all right, I'm in a chair. You know what? That's the easy part now. Mm-hmm. And going to school, that's also the easy part. 
And so I did that for about a year and a half. Um, and then I remember one time, it was a spring, springtime maybe, I was going across campus. It's not a big campus either. And I almost passed out just because of the low energy that I had because mm -hmm. dialysis takes it out of you. And, uh, and then I went to my advisor's office and I said, I can't do this. I've got to focus on my health. And so I ended up leaving school uh, just so I can focus on my health. Mm -hmm. um, and then continue dialysis. And oh, this whole time I'm fighting with insurance. And um, we did a fundraiser here in town for me. And at that time, when we did that fundraiser, uh, thanks, thanks to those Google alerts, mm -hmm. that some people know about <laughs> um, a mother and a daughter in the Bay Area found out about my story. I didn't know these people. They just saw the story called me and said I needed to get to Cedar Sign Medical Center in LA because they have this program called the ABO, the letters, uh, blood type letters, okay. ABO incompatible kidney transplant. And that could potentially save my life. So I did some research on it. And basically what the ABO incompatible protocol is, is that it, it doesn't matter what blood type you have. Okay. You can still have this transplant because of this therapy they do, this IV therapy. Okay. So a lot of people don't know that exists and it's, it's been around for a number of years now, but a lot of people think, well, you know, I'm not a match, so I can't donate so, right. Actually, you can, right. uh, with, with this therapy. Again, it's not a hundred percent foolproof, but Cedars last time I checked has a 98% success rate. Wow. Uh, the, you know, the, um, the hospital I was going to at the time didn't have this program and they told me that they were going to start it. And that I should just hang in there because they wanted me to be the first person to go through it. I refused. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I told them I have, you know, my spina bifida and some other, you know, things I'm dealing with. I don't want to be the first because if it goes bad, that's not going to go well for me, you know? Mm -hmm. So long story short, after about two years or so of fighting with my insurance, all the while I'm on dialysis. Uh, they finally made a contract with Cedar Sinai, and I was able to go over there. And um, after about a year of testing, I was able to have that transplant with my dad. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then I went back to school uh, just a few months later and finished my degree. So all in all, it took me about nine years to get my my four year degree. Kudos to you, because many people would have just given up like seriously. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Wow. I have, I have no words. I really have no words. Um, you almost have me like tearing up over here. Oh, wow. Wow. So tell, so what did you get your degree in and where did you go next from there? So my undergraduate degrees in business administration with an emphasis in sports management. Okay. And so what I wanted to do is I, I want, I loved sports my entire life. You know, my dad and I, that was always our connection, mm -hmm. uh, specifically basketball for the most part. Uh, you know, I love football too. And, and I'll watch other sports, but those are my two primary. Uh, you know, I played wheelchair basketball all those years as well. And so I always thought I wanted to, you know, coach or be a sports executive or something like that. So that's why I went for that degree. Mm -hmm. uh, as I was finishing up my degree, I was working in the, the uh, athletic department at the university. So that's when I really got my first taste of, you know, college athletics. Um, actually, backing up a number of years, right out of high school, I worked for a, a semi-professional hockey team just as a, an operations assistant intern. So that was actually my first experience. Okay. But once I worked in college athletics, I thought, this is great. This was, this was a lot of fun. But then I thought, you know, sports, it, it's fun, but there are long hours. And at that time, I really wanted to go into coaching. But then when I thought about it, coaching is a very volatile career. Mm -hmm. And the second you lose, you're done. You know, you get fired and you have to find something else. And I thought, well, with my, with my newfound health, I'm not sure that's probably the smartest thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. And so um, I ended up, you know, I, I had to find an office job. And so just a few months after graduation, uh, there was a, an Americans with Disabilities Act celebration here in town, as we have every year, of course. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to come speak and just say a few words by the local Goodwill Industries CEO of California. 
And I went, I spoke for a few words. She came up to me afterward and asked me if I'd ever heard of uh, an organization called the League of Dreams, uh, which is a local nonprofit here uh, for kids with disabilities. And I said, I hadn't heard about it. And so I went and the, um, it was run through a physical therapist here in town who happened to be my neighbor who supported me years before when I was on dialysis. Wow. He raised some money for me and things like that sat in his office for a few minutes and then he offers me the director job to oversee that program. So I wasn't expecting that. Um, I worked there for about a year and a half and helped build a, a baseball field here in Bakersfield for, for the program. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the first universally accessible baseball fields in the state of California. Wow. Uh, T-ball size. So, you know, real small. Yeah. But, uh, I was really proud of that project. Yeah. As you should and, be. Um, and then from there, I've, I've worked in public service you know, with, with local government. Um, I've worked in nonprofits um, and then I've worked a little bit in private industry. So it's always been helping people in some, some yeah. fashion. Yeah. So how many, um, how did you get involved with in, and tell some of the different places that you've spoken at? You've been keynote, can't talk, keynote speakers. You've, you've done the TEDx. Um, like how did that, how did that kind of take off? Was that like your first time speaking in public and then you kind of found your, your niche and your, what you wanted to do and how did that kind of take place? Well, it was interesting. Uh, so when I was in junior college and before all the diagnoses and all that happened, uh, I had a professor there and he, little did I know at the time that uh, he was world renowned. Uh, his name was Dr. Chuck Wall and he was the one who started the kindness movement. And his saying, his saying was, um, today I will commit one random act of senseless kindness, will you? And if you recall, there was a movie several years ago with Haley Joel Osment. Mm. Um, it was about, it was about that kindness movement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, it kind of had to do with what he, he had created. Uh, he wasn't necessarily affiliated with that film. But it, he really spread kindness throughout the whole world. And he happened to be blind. He was born blind. And so I really connected with him. He was my communications professor. So he was into public speaking, professional speaking. Um, he had spoken with um, Nelson Mandela, the Pope. He was on the Oprah Winfrey show wow. way back in the, in the early 90s. Uh -huh. So I really connected with him at that time. And he said, you know, one career path that you can consider is public speaking. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, if you research it, you'll see that there are a lot of people with disabilities in it. So that shouldn't be a hindrance to you. Mm -hmm. So I thought about it for a long time. And so fast forwarding, once I graduated from the university, um, you know, I, I had dinner with him the night of my graduation and I thanked him because he was a, an instrument, uh, instrument, an instrumental part, part of, mm -hmm. of, you know, my academic career up to that point. And and then uh, I found out, I think it was through him, that we were going to have a local TEDx set up here in Bakersfield. And so through him, I got invited to be one of the speakers. And that was the one and only time that he and I ever got to speak on stage together. That's and that so was cool exciting. Though. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they were separate speeches, but we got to see each other speak, uh, you know, several years after I was in his class. And that was, that was a special time for me. Um, about a year later, I ended up meeting a couple of professional speakers who came in town, and I got invited by another friend who was unaffiliated, you know, with this TEDx. And so I went and I watched them, and I said, "Hey, I need to get in contact with you guys. I need to get affiliated with you." One of those speakers was in a wheelchair. His name is Chad Hymas, and if you look at him, you look him up. Uh, a few years ago, he was named one of the greatest speakers in the world, and mm -hmm. he's in a wheelchair. Uh, he ended up having a bale of hay fall on him on his ranch and it broke his neck when he was, um, I think, in his late 20s. Wow. And so he travels the world now as a quadriplegic, as a professional speaker. So I became friends with him. And then through that group, I was able to meet somebody else who invited me to a second TEDx talk. So that, that's how that happened. That's pretty cool. What inspires you and motivates you to get up every morning? A number of things. So, you know, I really feel like I've been blessed and lucky to have the kidney transplant. You know, I 
thank God every day that, you know, that mom and daughter in the Bay Area found me and pointed me to Cedars. And then I thank God that my dad donated to me and we were able to make that work. And, you know, it's, it saved both of our lives, actually. He was a smoker at the time, so he had to stop what? and yeah. hasn't smoked since. And um, I think one of the biggest things that motivates me is that if I don't want this to sound selfish or anything, but I see things that I could potentially solve in the world. And so I think to myself, well, if I don't, who will? Well, mm-hmm. And so that's one thing that drives me. The other thing that drives me is my faith. And I shouldn't say the other thing. It's really my primary, primary thing. thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm not afraid to say that or speak about it. And I believe God has put me on this earth to help people. Amen. And so one of the things that, again, going back to my sports, um, I ended up, you, you said in my bio that, you know, I, I coached boys and girls basketball and that that is true for a few years. I did. I loved it. And I, and I miss it every day. Um, but, you know, looking back on it now, I realize it's, it wasn't, it was never about the basketball. That was just the vessel to do it. Mm-hmm. I was really coaching people. Mm-hmm. I was coaching young people. And I'm still in contact with uh, a, a few of my former athletes today. And, you know, a couple of them have emailed me or, or seen me out, you know, in the, in the community and said, you know, you really, really changed my life, mm-hmm. you know, with what you did. And, um, you know, I always just wanted to be there for them. And I thought, you know, if I can, if I can do that for them, what about people with physical disabilities who don't necessarily have wow. that in their life, be it family or friends or mentors you know I, I want to do that for them and so that's that's really what's led me to where I am today and in, in you know getting my business started to to coach and mentor people like me right I love what is your greatest failure that's a great question I think I've probably had multiple failures in life I, I think we all had those um Without them, we don't learn though. <laughs> that's true. That, that's very, very true. From a personal standpoint, I would say one of my greatest failures has been not, probably not taking as good of care of myself, especially physically in my younger years that I could have and then should have, mm-hmm. you know, and whether that led to other health issues, I, I can't say certainly, it probably didn't help. So that's one. Um, professionally, I would say probably consistency as far as, well, consistency and taking opportunities as they come. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, being scared, being fearful of not only a failure, but the, the lesser known and the lesser talked about is the fear of success. Mm-hmm. Because what if, what if it turns out better than you can even imagine, Mm -hmm. you know, like with your podcast or what if you had never done this, Mm -hmm. but what if, what if this thing turns out to be one of the biggest and best podcasts in the world, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that that would all to him. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm glad you said that, but at the same time, I don't think that makes it any less scary. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so for me, I think it's taking those chances and then once I'm taking those chances, just being consistent consistent with them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Tell us about um, real life enterprises. Yeah, so it's it's still in the beginning stages. And, you know, really, it's been in my mind for a number of years. So it's not brand new to me, but I'm finally, again, with the consistency mm-hmm. part, getting it out in the world. I basically want to mentor people, younger people like me who have families who are supportive, but they don't necessarily have all the resources and the knowledge to help their family member get out there. And also those people like me who I think have the desire to do more, Mm -hmm. but are scared or they don't know what that first step or that next step is. Right. And And who better to to help them and guide them than you? Because you're, you actually live this, like, uh, you know, parents and family members can only help and do and guide so much, but we are not living 
with those disabilities, if you will, like you are actually living it. So you really know you're like, you're in their shoes. We're not in their shoes. We're with them, but we don't know the actual, how they feel and some of the really barriers that, that they, that they do and how it can really affect them, if you will. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I, and I see what you're saying. And I, I think I took that position for a long time. But the other thing is that if you flip it around, I also don't know what it's like to be you. That's I don't know true. what it's like to be a parent with a child with a disability. I can speculate mm -hmm. and I could guess. Um, but I, I don't know what it's like to have that worry being a right. parent. I mean, I've heard, I have friends with, with kids. So, you know, I can imagine that it's, it's hard enough to have a, a child who doesn't have disabilities, mm -hmm. but then you throw that into the mix and that adds additional yeah. complications to it. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, a lot of families like yours and like mine, we have the, we have the mindset that we want to get out there and we want to do more. We just don't know how, and we don't, there's not a roadmap map to do mm -hmm. it, you know, and, and I'm not saying I have the one and only answer. So, you know, listen to me, but I think that over the course of my life, I've made plenty of mistakes and figured out tons of ways not to do things. And I think I found a few ways that do work. Right. And so if I can lend that support to both the individual with the disability and their support Forks. system, mm -hmm. I really think I could be a big help, you know, to, to, to help them move forward. And I think, you know, in the disability community, it's different because of the so many, so many barriers we have to face on a daily basis. We don't really have too many people who, who are out there who have figured it all out. I mean, we have a lot of fantastic people that I'm sure you and I you know, know about who, who are known, you know, in the United States and around the world, but we don't, we don't know how they did what they've done. Mm -hmm. We don't know the system. We don't know the process that they've gone through. Mm -hmm. And I think in part, they may not know how they went through that, the other part, and I don't like to say this, but I think there's some honesty and some truth to it. They don't want to tell you how they went through it mm, yeah. because when, when they, we, when you tell that story, especially in, in, in our cases, there's a lot of vulnerability there. Yes. Yes. And vulnerability is scary. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people, you know, everybody in the world has some level of vulnerability, but I think ours is different in a way. And again, I'm not saying that's any better or worse. There, there's no right. judgment when I say that. Right. But, you know, without going into specific details, I mean, you and I could talk about this all day long, you know, offline, but there are some very private things that we have to go through that, you know, you really probably don't want to share with share. the world, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, even if it does help a lot of people. And so I think that's a big part of it too, that people have the the ability to be more successful, especially in the disability community. They just don't know how to go about it. About they don't it. have that support system from the people who have gone through it. So if mm -hmm. I can be that for them, you know, that's what I'd love to do. Love that. Mm -mm -mm. I love that. So how can people find you, get in touch with you um, and or, you know, for someone that wants to work with you, how do, how would one get in touch with you? Sure. So again, my business is real life coaching and it's W H E E L uh, and in life L I F E coaching. So my website is wheellifecoaching.com. And again, I just want to emphasize it's uh, two L's one in wheel one in life <laughs> mm -hmm. wheellifecoaching.com. Awesome. And I'm going to go ahead and put that all in the show notes too. So that way they can just click right in there. Right. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share or any advice that you would like to give um, before we wrap things up or? Yeah, I, a couple of things, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Don't be afraid. Um, you know, be, be courageous, have courage to live the life you want to live. And you may not be able to do everything you want to do in life. You know, I, I was never going to play in the NBA as much as I wanted to. I'm not going to grow up to be six foot nine to dunk the basketball <laughs> as much as I want to. 
but there are many ways that you can accomplish things in life. And, you know, one thing I want to tell the, the parents and the, the, the families and the friends, just be there, be that support system, because you can really make the difference for your family member or your friend. And that's all they really need. Mm-hmm. There, there are so many people and I, I could tell you stories. We could be here another couple of hours where I could tell you stories of friends who have the exact same disability as me, who could be your next guest on this podcast. And they sit at home all day and they hang out on Facebook Mm -hmm. and they watch TV and they eat. And that's the extent of their life. Life. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they don't have somebody in their immediate family Family uh, or immediate support, you know, who Mm -hmm. could really show that they believe in them. And so I've called them or I've reached out to them and, you know, I've tried to be that support system. And in some ways it's helped. And in some ways they just tell me you you don't understand. And it's, it's heart wrenching because I want to help those people, Mm -hmm. but I've come to the realization that, you know, not everybody can be helped or want even want to be helped. Right. And they have to, they have to be willing to take that step and accept that help to get out of their own way. They do. Yeah. So again, surround yourself with good people who, who believe in you, who support you. Um, and if you can't find that in your family, or your friends, you know, send me an email, give me a call, click contact, uh, my contact information on my website. I'd be glad to help. I, I really feel there's so much potential in this world for people with disabilities, with people with disabilities. You just have to take that risk. You just have to do it. Yeah. Now, one last thing. So I gift all of my guests um, just a small token of appreciation with um, a hand stamp word. I actually hand stamp it with a hammer and stamps and I put the word into a token um, because words are powerful. You know, they remind us they can be a daily reminder. Uh, you know, they can inspire us to do great things. They can. Um, words are just powerful. So I want to ask you. What would, if you could choose one word, what would it be and why? Oh, I could probably pick a ton of words. But, <laughs> um, but if I had to pick one, and I and I talked about this today with you, it's probably consistency. Just, just be consistent. And I have to remind myself of that every day. You know, I'm I'm definitely not immune to laziness. I'm not immune to, you know, giving up at times. I've done that. You know, as I said earlier, my my business idea that we're talking about, it's been in my mind for at least the last eight years. And that's the mm-hmm. truth. And I'm just now taking that courage to be consistent to get it launched. Because and I believe I in you just just listening to you and and getting to know you in this short, you know, what hour and what maybe 15 minutes prior to, to everything, you know, just seeing you on Facebook and stuff. Yeah. You have a lot to offer and I think that you're going to do great things. Um, and yeah, I think you'll do it because look at it, look at what, what, what you've overcome already and look just like how, how you said, how long it took you to, you know, to finish school, but you did it. Okay. Well now you started this, this was something in your mind, you know, for the last eight years, well, you're going to get it done. You're going to do it. And you're going to help so many people and do amazing things. Um, and I can't wait to see, because then, you know what, in two more years, we'll have you back on or less than that. And we can go over all the things that, you know, and go back and hash out this, this podcast and see how far you've actually come and how many lives that, you know, you've touched and helped like that's, that's huge. That's huge. That's huge. Yeah. I I would love that. And, you know, if there's anything I can do to to help you and, and your daughter or, you know, your, your family or your audience, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. I, I'd love to, to do that, whether, you know, it's coming back on the podcast or partnering in some other kind of way, you know, whatever yeah. that looks like, you know, I'd love to do that. Absolutely. I would love that. Well, on that note, I just want to thank you again one more time for being on the show. Um, it was great getting to know you and um, for being vulnerable and sharing your story. And um, I wish you nothing but the best. And I look forward to us connecting again in the future. Yeah. Thank you so much. For right, having thank me. you, everybody, for listening. Um, take care. And I will have all of his contact and email information in the show notes. Till next time. Thanks so much, guys. Bye bye. 
Thank you for joining us as we spread awareness through our personal stories and the many resources shared. You can help us by joining our village simply by sharing our show to the masses. If you would like to support the Gilbo Girls on another level, click on the link in the show notes to make a donation in any amount. Add your address and you'll receive a hand stamped token with the word village on it in appreciation. Be sure to subscribe to our Gilbo Girls podcast and YouTube show. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Gilbo Girls. Till next time. <laughs>